Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Construction Intel Summit KSA. Thank you all for joining us once again, and I hope you found yesterday's session informative and insightful. Judging by the volume of questions <coughs> we received from the audience, it certainly seemed like that. If you have any further questions for David Kinnenberg and his panel, please do get in touch with us, and we'll make sure to pass it on to them. Now, moving on to day two of the summit. We've got a really good session lined up for you to at Saudi Arabia's mega projects, the iconic headline grabbing hospitality and tourism developments that are often the size of small countries. These projects are a critical vision, part of Vision 2030, and they all cater to, they cater to different sectors of society. They all come with their own challenges and opportunities, and our experts today will discuss how to best build and deliver them, and what the regional construction industry needs to do in, ter in terms of meeting the demand of the ambitious developers that are developing them. So now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce today's panel, chaired by David Clifton, sorry, chaired by David Clifton of Hill International, who, and he'll be joined by David Watkins of Amala, Christopher Fannin of Insight, Bradley Karuk of Atkins, and Simon Trafford from Turner and Townsend KSA. Now, following the panel discussion at 12 p.m. UA time, James Frampton of MTWO will be giving a keynote presentation about how platform technology helps KSA Remember to keep sending questions via our live chat that will be running alongside the broadcast stream. Have a great day, and it's over to you now, David. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Gavin, and good morning to everybody that's uh, joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a very great pleasure to have such a distinguished panel. Um, I mean, just as by way of an introduction, I would like to welcome the panel uh, from myself and on behalf of CPI, and maybe a quick introduction as to what they currently perform as a role within their organizations, and a quick intro to the organizations, maybe 30 seconds or so. So with that on the screen, David is the, uh, Watkins is the first gentleman on the panel. Please, would you introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the conference. Um, my name's David Watkins. I'm the Chief Project Delivery Officer at Amala. Amala is one of the giga projects in Saudi Arabia on the West Coast, primarily focused on hospitality, and we're here to support the 2030 Saudi vision. Brilliant. And uh, although uh, I, th I think we're having some issues with the video for Christopher, uh, if Chris is online, maybe he can introduce himself. If not, I'll move to Bradley. Okay, so for uh, Bradley, please would you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, David. Hi, everyone else. My name is Brad Carrick. I am the project director for <coughs> creative theming and show design with Atkins. Uh, we are uh, a much more diverse group and more fully integrated to create uh, guest destinations that are truly uh, one of a kind. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Simon, good morning. Please would you introduce yourself? Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Simon Trafford. I'm a country manager for Turner and Townsend's operations in Saudi Arabia, Turner and Townsend being a a global project and cost management uh, consultancy, and we're currently working across most, if not all, the Giga projects in Saudi Arabia. Brilliant. Oh, and Christopher has uh, managed to sort the IT out. Good morning, Christopher. Would you please introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it was. Uh, I'm sure it was operator error. Um, yeah. Hi. I'm. Yeah. I'm Chris Van. And I lead. Uh, Insight, we're planners and landscape architects. We're working across a number of the, of the Giga projects in KSA. And, um, you know, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. This is, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Good. Well, look, that's wonderful. And gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. And we've sorted out our IT glitches, wonderful world that we live in during this last 18 months. Since this panel is um, orientated around building a destination, there are quite a few themes that we'll look to look to address over the coming uh, 55 minutes. But building a destination, let's start with the obvious question. And I'd like to address this to Bradley, which is, what is a destination and what makes the destination? Sure. So, I mean, we all 
want to get away from our, our <laughs> normal livelihoods and go somewhere and experience something that we're gonna that's gonna make us happy and fulfilled. And a destination will do that when it's done properly. You know, to create a destination is really from my purpose as a creative director is to create an experience that's memorable and exciting and something that guests want to basically tell their friends and family uh, to go and see themselves as well as become a repeat customer because we want guests to keep coming back. So it's really about the, about the story, the, the narrative, uh, how it unfolds, what are the experiences, those mix of experiences and how they're targeted specifically towards that guest profile. Excellent. And and when we look at um, how, say, a giga project such as Amala um, would set itself up with that in mind, David, um, how, how has Amala gone around sort of addressing that? If we start to look at how do we, how do, as Bradley said, how do we get people talking about wanting to come to Saudi and indeed wanting to come back? Because let's face it, you're going to need return and repeat visitors. So I'm, I'm sure Amala's got that at the heart of some of its thought processes. Oh, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, Saudi Arabia for a long time hasn't really been on the world stage as far as hospitality is concerned. Um, the west coast where Amala is located is a, is an amazing part of the Arabian Peninsula. It has a sense of history going back to pre-Roman times. There's still Romans forts. There's a beautiful natural landscape, the Red Sea and the reefs around the Red Sea. So we're fortunate to have a, a fantastic setting to be able to um, develop um, in harmony within a sustainable way to attract those guests and, and really give people an understanding of what Saudi Arabia is about as a tourist destination. And it's such a big place, there's lots to see. There's no doubt that when people get to experience Saudi Arabia that they will be coming back again and again, which is obviously the aim of you know, developing the hospitality sector here. Excellent. And, and actually, and with that in mind, coming from a planner sort of architectural perspective, Chris, I mean, how do you how do you guys at Insight tune into that? And what are you doing to sort of help support those visions that uh, David and Bradley were sort of outlining just then? Well, I think that um, each of the each of the Giga projects has sort of uh, positioned themselves relative to those environments that they that they that they rest within and I think also in in the case of, of some of them say a Kadea where the where the 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 kind of intention of that project is all is sort of entertainment based there's a, a kind of twist that's applied to that Amala um, where we're also working you know that's really a, a, a very very sensitive and um, a kind of light touch to the way that the that the landscape's being sort of perceived and the kind of customer experience as Bradley was talking about is kind of seamless where the the resort emerges from the terrain. Um, so I think it 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 sort of varies according to sort of the the kind of the Giga project vision of where they want how they want to kind of manipulate their landscape and their play. And then you find a way to express express that you know, through planted form and, and earth. Okay, wonderful. And, and, and coming to Simon, as, um, as a project management and cost consultant, um, you obviously got to be very cognizant of the type of people you bring in terms of this, in terms of this visioning. And what, I mean, what's the experience of your organization in terms of being able to support that, that vision? Because then you've already well, mentioned well, that you're working across most of the projects. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fine. Um, so, so, yeah, so, 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 what we what we do is we uh, we look at the various assets that are contained within each of these uh, projects, and we try and we try and find the best people within the business um, that have those aligned uh, experiences that they can bring bring to these projects. Um, so, so as you, as, you, as you're fully aware, you know this is predominantly hospitality, but um, underpinning hospitality is infrastructure, and we bring a very strong infrastructure team in to underpin these projects and then bring in specialist subject uh, people to, to, to push forward the various assets, whether it be hospitality or any of the other assets that they're, 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 they're looking at. So, so we, we, we take it very seriously and we, and we choose our people very carefully to make sure that we have the right skill set brought in for each of the assets. 
Good stuff. You, you make an interesting point about selecting the right people, which brings me quite nicely onto a conversation around um, with so many of these schemes that are, in essence, largely in competition with each other. And you know what uh, we we now need move into how do we how do we attract resource? And I'm going to address that because you started the the line of conversation, Simon. Back to you uh, to start with, and then move to the other gentleman. Um, how do we attract those that, that resource? And then it's also for another question, really, which we'll move to, to David for, is also how do we start attracting the investor interests and the international players that go with it? Yeah, sure. So, so cer certainly one of the major attractions that um, we're, we're able to take to potential candidates to bring into the team here in Saudi Arabia is the opportunity to work on these breathtaking schemes. And uh, what 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 we're being involved in here is like nobody else is delivering across the globe so for so for sure you know what we're able to sell is this unique opportunity to work on on schemes um that really are, the scale of which are not being delivered elsewhere um whilst that's a major attraction um we do have to face the fact that uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is not necessarily top of everybody's list, um, and therefore not everybody is queuing up to come in. And therefore, what we are finding um, is a relatively limited pool of people that will come on board. Um, and that's not to say we can't find them, but, you know, the scale of the projects and the pace of the projects and the volume of the projects that we're dealing with here is creating a very significant uh, challenge for anybody trying to resource. So even even Amala trying to put their own team together, you know, we're all fishing in the same pool for the same limited resource. So trying to put packages together that are attractive to our teams and, and to bring people in, you know, is, is, is key to success of, of bringing those right people in. But but ultimately what we're trying to sell is this unique opportunity to work on these giga projects. Yeah, before absolutely, and I, and I do I do agree, and I, I think I think most of us are all in a similar position, as you quite rightly point out. But before going to David to talk about how do you attract international uh, players, Bradley is in a very specific area of expertise, and the pool is, I'm sure, relatively limited. How are you finding the engagement with? Um, resources, specialist subconsultants, um, even the specialist contractors that you'll require for show ride, etc. How, how is that being engaged across the international marketplace, Bradley? Are you are you seeing interest in this? Yeah, you know the world has changed a lot over the last eighteen months, and and this remote effort to, uh, from different sides of the globe has really integrated the ability for all of us to start to use some of the experts that know how to do this type of work. You know, in my industry, it, it's a very small group of us that actually do what we do. There's mm. there's really no schooling from it. It comes out of a, a pedigree of experience and, and focus on certain areas, which then leads you into the entertainment creative sector. Um, the, the draw, you know, the, the draw is the kind of projects that are happening in, in KSA. Like, you know, currently I'm working on Six Flags Cadilla. You know, we're do, Atkins is doing all of the creative design to build for it. And it's those kinds of projects that require the expertise that n isn't necessarily in this area of, of, of the world. So the ability to remotely work, I'm on Vancouver Island. You know, who would have thought I would be working in KSA on, on KSA time on projects there? But the, the interest is definitely there with the type of giga projects that are happening. So those experts um, that are able to do this kind of work at the high level and the top shelf quality that's required certainly have an ear to the ground and are interested more these days than they were in the past. We'll Well, I'm, I'm getting a very good feeling from what's happening, and I think there's going to be a lot more interest as time progresses. And the kind of projects that are happening in case they are certainly going to bring the people from around the globe, um, you know, previously to where they didn't have that type of attraction. Which leads very nicely into um, 
David, and the how do we and and how are you seeing engagement from an international market? Um, both resources, as Simon and Bradley have alluded to, there are some challenges. But in terms of the activity models, because um, you know, I'm guessing that contract and supply chain uh, ability and capability are some somewhat challenged at the moment. And you know, what issues do you ex do you think that there are in terms of being able to get that international engagement? Well, I think there's a couple of interesting things and, and Bradley sort of touched on it, I think, from the consultancy background. You know, one, one thing that COVID has done is forced us all to leverage the technology side of the business more. Whereas traditionally as a client, we would request consultants to fly into the kingdom, to be based into the kingdom and all those resource challenges that we've just spoken about, um, you know, are part of the problem. But I think what COVID has done is we've seen an alternative option of being able to get the best resources in the world and be flexible enough to allow them to stay in their home bases as well as to travel out so that we, we can get the best resources because we're able to have that flexibility on the consultancy side, on the design side. I think obviously on the, the project delivery side, we, we need people on the ground. Um, it, it's not a case of remote working working so well. However, sort of during 2020, we were able to onboard and mobilise people remotely, um, do a lot of the pre-planning phase um, of the works um, remotely without people in the country. And then as things have started to free up, we're able to mobilise people more and more um, and get them into the kingdom. Um, so we've, we've had that little bit of flexibility, which has helped. On the contracting side, um, a lot more challenging. Um, what we're finding with a lot of the international players is there's been a, a reluctance to fully engage with the kingdom, both because of, you know, the uncertainty around COVID, um, but also from the track record of their participation in the kingdom in the past, which is, which is you know, issues around um, delays to payments and all those sorts of things, which are which are sort of fundamental to a, a ca you know, cash flow needed business. So, you know, we've looked at internet, we're looking at the international market. How do we encourage them to come here? How do we give that confidence and certainty um, around working in the kingdom and re-establishing in the kingdom? And at the same time, looking at the capability and capacity of the local market. Um, so a lot of my outreach has been with Saudi Council of Engineers and Saudi Contractors Authority and some of the, the government authorities that have been set up specifically to address to, or help to address this issue. Okay, that's, that's very good. And that's a subject that I'd like to come on to shortly, but I'm going to ask Chris the similar sort of principle. As, um, as, a, as a, uh, an architect, uh, have you seen this as a bit of a minor benefit in terms of the last sort of year, 18 months with the attraction remotely and being able to sort of work as best as we can via teams, which has enabled you to sort of ha have that more sort of collaborative style. Um, because obviously from a designer's perspective, uh, there is still quite, in my experience of managing it, it's this still, this still quite nice to sort of all get in a room with a whiteboard and throw a few ideas up on the screen and all challenge with each other. Um, ha how have you found it? I'm on, on mute. Um, no, it's it's in many ways. I'd say it's been a benefit for us. We because we're we're here. We're we're local. We've been able to, when possible, to to, be able to sit with our clients. Um, but I think the I just I just think that the you know I'm I'm waiting for the swing to go back a little bit towards more in person meetings, more travel. Um, and I'm wondering where that balance will be. I think it's going to be a better balance. And, you know, I, you know Bradley's not going to have to fly here once a week uh, to present his work from Vancouver. I think that, you know, it's, there's, we're going to save cost and wear and tear in the teams moving forward. Um, and so I think that's, that's a, a tremendous benefit. I mean, I, I think the issue of, of resources, you know, we have, there's sort of, there's the human resource part of the, of, that's a problem that we're all working on, you know, attracting the, the right and best talent to work on the projects. And then obviously there's a huge material resource pinch coming that is very concerning. And, uh, you know, 
so that's not the kind of shift the conversation, but um, you know, this is a, to me is going to be. There's going to be a reckoning um, at some point. I just don't know where, when, and where. You know how you manage your way out of that. Yeah. Um, given I know David's trying to deliver projects, and then there's you know there's five other people in the same seat and different gigs <coughs> trying to deliver projects, and it it, it strikes me as a, a very sort of complex um, set of issues. Um, you know, just yeah. not to dominate, but just to put it in perspective, in my little part of the world, we we are working in three projects. We're we need right now 129,175 trees. That's just one element. If you think of 130,000 trees, um, yeah, I'm not steel, concrete, blah, blah, you know, the list goes on. So <clears throat> those are the things that sort of concern me, the design part, on the delivery part is frightening. That's actually leading quite nicely onto a question that I'd like to address to Simon. As looking as a, as a, a quite a well-known economic commentator myself, I'm not going to come and take some of your moderator. But Simon, perhaps you'd like to address this. I mean, we've seen commodity prices rising. You've seen, let's just say, rebar going up just on a global perspective anyway. I mean, what do you foresee as TNT? Because I mean, obviously, we, most of us will probably know you as a cost consultant, and I know you do project management yeah. as well, but you've probably got more data available even than I have. But what, where do you see this trend analysis, and how do you see attracting people given the global recovery? And also, attra sorry, attracting the, but the delivery of supply change, basically. Because we, we see massive yeah, price rises in commodities. Yes, yeah, so, so 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 we are starting to see that, and uh, and as you can imagine, COVID hasn't helped that situation. So I think I think we were already facing um, the inevitable in Saudi, just because of the, as I said before, you know, the volume of projects that are happening all at the same time. Um, but what we're also seeing globally is um, there is a general sort of pickup around the world, and what we're going to see, and and are already starting to experience, is uh, certain parts of the supply chain actually picking and choosing where they where they go and do business and where they focus their efforts and the biggest thing that's going to influence uh the appetite for saudi is is not necessarily the size of the prize but it is it is the risk that it is associated that work of working uh, in Saudi Arabia. And I don't think there's an organization that operates here that does not talk about risk and debt on a daily basis uh, in Saudi. And until that's addressed, I think we're going to find it very difficult to loosen that uh, supply chain and get them to focus on Saudi as a, a venue of choice to do to do business. Um, so it's, it's extremely challenging. Um, and it and it was difficult enough without without COVID, but the sheer volume of um, projects, the sheer volume of materials that are that are required. So Chris has just mentioned trees on one project. Multiply that over ten projects of a similar size. You know there there are it is almost getting to the point on certain materials they're just not enough um, to go round just to service the uh, the Saudi demand. And if you have other projects, other markets with easier trading conditions, then there's going to be a natural diversion of materials away from Saudi in the future. And that's just going to drive prices up as we are starting to see. Yes. And that's quite interesting. Before coming back to David, I'd like to ask Bradley that you are working in a very specific uh, industry and quite a lot of your supply chain is um, by and large SME, SME, small medium enterprises and you know you've only got there's a very limited capacity how how would you kind of how do you see the supply chain engaging from your specialist area and are they interested or, in, or is there other projects worldwide that are going on that are going to force um, inflationary pressures into your business I mean <clears throat> you've, you've got you've got to be booking slots for some of your um, deliverables from your supply chain quite a, quite a long way in advance I would I would I would guess having run an SME some years ago myself yeah it's it's an interesting question it's becoming a bigger challenge you know as a create when we're developing creative you know we want specific things to to uh, you know fulfill that narrative that we're trying to develop for the guest experience so when a project you know you're starting on at five years sometimes six years prior to even the doors opening you have to really kind of be a, 
a fortune teller and forecast what's going to happen by the time those doors open. So on the creative side, that supply chain becomes very critical because if you want something very specific for that experience, is it going to be available two, three years later by the time you require those assets to be put in place? Um, you, you have to constantly be thinking that and have a backup plan too. You know, if it's not going to work, what do you, what's your, what's your backup plan? What are you going to replace it with? What are you going to, what's going to change creatively that could really affect the concept and the entire guest experience. So it's, it's a real tightrope that we're continually walking all the time when developing this, because it's not just, you know, come up with a few ideas and the doors open within a few weeks, it's several years. So it, it, it is a challenge and something you can't lose focus on. Right, um, and and you are in a very specific area, which is which is relatively small, as you mentioned earlier. On a much broader perspective, David, I mean, Simon's already been talking about you're going to be driving inflationary pressures. We've got uh, supply chain diversion because there's only a finite capacity worldwide, and we're seeing a global economy. How's how's Amala trying to sort of risk manage that in terms of? Um, well, obviously, there's inf the money side of it is, of course, important. But in terms of actually getting the deliverables on the ground, I suspect that's probably even more important currently. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we've got to look a long way ahead um, at the supply chain sort of issues. And some of its logistically challenge logistical challenges have been located where we are without the infrastructure around. But sort of planning ahead and 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 sort of locking down, um, you know, locking down rebar supply, concrete supply, those sort of things as early as possible, even without the designs, you know, on on one of our master plan, one of the four master plans that we're working on, you know, we we're going to need eight hundred thousand cubes of concrete just on one of them. So, you know, what do the materials look like? Just for, and and those sort of raw materials are sort of the easy part of the equation, rebar, locking that down. Prefabrication, you know, going into, you know, areas where we're prefabricating in other countries, um, you know, the old view of prefabrication and modular is a whole bunch of shipping containers with windows cut out and a, a nice <laughs> coat of paint. But obviously pre prefabrication is a lot more sophisticated than that and modularization is a yeah. lot more sophisticated than that. So, so really looking at those sorts of opportunities, um, it has the benefit of, of, being able to plan a long time ahead, reduce the labour force. You know, I'm going to have upwards of 40,000 labourers on Amala at peak in, um, you know, end of 23, beginning of 24. Um, so how do we reduce that headcount um, and how do we plan well and truly ahead material selections when we're interacting with the designers, plant selection on the landscaping side, making sure we're not, you know, designing with lots of exotics, um, with import restrictions, you know, those, those sorts of things of actually understanding the design at the early days to and understanding the risk to be able to sort of plan around them as best we can and have plan B, C, D, E, F and G all ready to go, hopefully as well. Excellent. And you, you made an interesting point then. So, Chris, in terms of how your design principles are, are working currently, are you are you getting client information to clients for procurement purposes as a, a lot earlier now, and, to, and and changing your principles? Because I don't say this respectfully, as not being an architect, architects have, have been known to 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 sort of, uh, look at exotica that might not otherwise be available. If your design principles had to uh, change recent over recent times, obviously because of COVID, but also secondly because of the supply chain issues. Well, the, I, you know, for us, the, the supply chain issues are just starting to hit a little bit. But I think you know, all the projects are really looking at a at a you know a very high bar in terms of sustainability. So the so the intent the intent is to use as many natives as as possible. Typically, natives aren't grown at, at you know at, at scale. So this is there's going to be a crunch quite quickly. Um, you know, just to put in perspective a little bit. You know, when we worked on City Center um, in my former firm, we were we were doing plant selection for two years prior to construction. Um, City Center is different. It's super complex it's tight every every placement mattered every tree had a specific purpose and scale and, and intent but the procurement process was happening on plant side plant buyer you know there was someone that's all their job was we were constantly doing as we went through the design process that's right now there's a lag and that's and that's going to hurt us 
when we get further down, things are just starting to go to tender. We're just starting to get tender returns and seeing what we can actually get because no one wants to plant, you know, have a bunch of Charlie Brown trees, nor do you want to have to, you know, import absolutely everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's going to be, you know, quite a sort of complicated build process, I think, where we're going to have to make lots of decisions in the field, honestly. Well, that's that's interesting. So, so, so with that, Simon, I mean, as a project manager and, and a cost manager, I mean, what uh, you're obviously, like myself, uh, uh, something that the clients lean on very hard to provide these risk mitigation strategies that you worked with, uh, you spoke about earlier. I'm just sort of interested to see what tack you're taking. David spoke about sort of bulk buying rebar, so you could look at spot futures or something such as that. What sort of sort of plans are you guys putting in place at Turner and Townsend to, to support the clients in this delivery? Well, so, certainly one of the things we're, we're trying to do at the moment is basically uh, track uh, the rate of escalation of, of commodity prices uh, in Kingdom. It's not previously been done before, and we are, we are now monitoring that very closely so that we can advise um, where and how and the, and the rate at which we're expecting to see products uh, increasing in price. But certainly having conversations about um, procurement, forward procurement, um, and uh, trying to assess at the earliest stage the sort of volumes of materials being required. David had alluded to 800,000 cube um, on on one project alone, but uh, at, the, at the very early stages, even at ma master master plan stage, <laughs> we're able to support the client and just give some head up numbers, um, which allows in early procurement conversations about forward forward buying and locking in supplies. Um, and mm. but at the moment beyond that, you know, it's it, it, it's very difficult to do that. But what we're trying to do is safeguard some of the key materials. There's going to be materials which are always going to be a challenge to resource, um, particularly given the aspiration of many of these schemes to be delivering um, particularly at the in the hospitality and luxury that has sort of never been experienced before. And there's, there's going to be a very finite amount of suppliers that are going to be able to come forth, particularly with the bespoke furniture that we're looking at on many of the the, the projects. Mm. Um, uh, bespoke light fittings, you know, you've got a very, very limited supply chain uh, that, that can supply, you know, those sort of items. And it's about trying to get them to either identify very early what where they're going to go in that direction or indeed encourage them to go more along a mainstream product, which is going to be easier to source. Because behind all of this um, supply chain issue actually is the extraordinarily challenging timescales that uh, these major projects are being asked to deliver. So we look at all of the giga projects, they all have a date that is in 2023. And somebody at some point has to step back and say, how on earth can all of this happen at the same time? And something has to give. So so what we're saying to these, what we're saying to our clients is that, you know, let's take a step back, let's have a look at what's important and see how we can safeguard the supply of those materials uh, moving forward. Yeah, and that's and that's interesting. I mean, because um, when I asked Chris, has it changed the uh, design principles? I mean, um, I, uh, Bradley, I, I mean, are you are you now looking working with the the guys at Kadia in terms of uh, trying to get that early slot locked in? So Simon alluded to. I mean, you're obviously more specialist, as we mentioned previously, but you need to be locking in the this this sort of capacity and is, is that changed your design principles be, and you're trying to give sort of like early warning for Kadir to go and or, uh, to go and procure that sort of capacity in the same way that uh, David has alluded to what what they're trying to do with the Amala crit teams and Simon is is recommending and and you know a very well respected cost consultancy business um is looking to try and get the data so you'll be no doubt experiencing similar types of pressures so what's your recommendations to your client yeah so what's happened is to ensure that procurement can be successful essentially the clients are forcing us on the creative side to take six months of work and condense it into eight weeks. That's really what's happening. And it puts an immense load of pressure on the creative team because, you know, 
<laughs> good ideas take time. They just don't, you know, I just don't have a box full of ideas and pull them out and say, hey, let's use this one. You know, <laughs> you're trying to do something that's unique and something that people have never seen before. That takes a little bit of time. And this pressure um, on the scheduling, it's huge. It's just huge. So it requires more resources. It requires more experts so that we can get to that point where we can take the drawings in, in schematic and go out for procurement so that we can basically make sure that that creative intent is held through with all of the, the concrete that needs to be acquired, all of the, all of the trees, all, and there's a lot of specialty things as well, you know, is the right kind of, yeah. kind of steel ability going to be there? It, it, you know, it, 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 it is interesting times, that's for sure. And it makes it for the, the pressure is immense. I think it's more than ever. And it's a good thing that some of us get to work remotely like this because, you know, at the end of the day, you need to really have the ability to unwind. And, you know, sitting in my backyard looking at the, the forest and the ocean and, and the mountains kind of makes me get ready for the next day. So it, 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 it is very clear that it takes uh, – we're, we're being provided a lot less time to do the same amount of work that we did 10 years ago. And, and it's all, I think it's all related to procurement to ensure that we have those items in place when the thing's being built. You make an interesting point about compressed schedules for the designers. Um, and I'm going to, before going back to David, I'm going I'm to ask him a question around this from the client perspective. But Chris, I, I'm guessing you're probably experiencing a very similar kind of um, uh, expectation currently as uh, from a landscaping perspective. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I mean it. Uh, and uh, obviously, there's, there's, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been shifts in leadership, changes in direction. You know, those are, those are kind of, you know, that sort of happens in every project. That's, that's not unusual. But yeah, the time, the pressure to deliver is, is extremely, extremely intense. You know, I, I want to just throw something out. You know, is there within? I mean. If we have all these competing projects for a lot of the same things, now, I've obviously talked about trees, but there's tons of stuff. Is there something, a structure within PIF that 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 choreographs, you know, is there any, is there a, a kind of a governing mechanism? I know David's smiling. I'm hoping he has an answer for this. But that yeah, I'll, I'll let that. David answer that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, but that to me is would seem to make the most sense. You need some kind of governance to organize it better. Yeah, look, I, I think um, the interesting thing is, and then obviously we've had a lot of these discussions because most of our projects are, you know, the seed funding comes from PIF, the Public Investment Fund. Um, you know, we do have, and there is starting to be a lot more of it this year, um, coordination meetings across the Giga projects to discuss these very topics, and and PIF is very aware, both from an, a pricing point of view and and having that buying advantage of of sort of linking the Giga projects together, um, making sure the projects are coordinated on the infrastructure side, so we're not all independently um, producing massive power grids or water grids, and making sure that particularly along the west coast area. Um, it's a much more integrated approach. It's still in its infancy and still in its early days, but, you know, I've had um, meetings with the other Giga projects across, um, you know, developing, developing contractor capacity in, in, say, modular construction and how we're going to support that as part of the, the Giga projects, how we're going to um, keep an eye on pricing and inflation and prelims costs, which are sort of all over the price with the, the bidding all over the place you know, with the bids that we receive at the moment. So um, there is an understanding there, there is a recognition there, and um, there is starting to get some momentum around sort of that, that specific topic. That's interesting that you talk about the sort of getting a bit more integrated because originally when all of these set off and running, they were all a little bit, all everyone was on their own a touch. But there's some questions, there's quite a lot of questions coming in at the moment, but it's in, is there a sort of um, a coordination on sort of digital twin and BIM models and so forth as well in terms of using one one sort of source of the truth, as it were, across across the PIF projects? I mean, or are you all empowered to just use, utilize your own modeling? And I'm assuming the BIM's very much out there for all of them. But uh, I'll let the designers comment on that as well. So, David, I mean, is there a is there a unified sort of strategy around that as well? 
Well, absolutely. Look, I think we've all been in the industry long enough to see how it's dramatically changed over the last sort of 20, 30 years, you know, from a very paper-based design to, to BIM. And, you know, I'm sure we've all experienced, uh, you know, what the definition of BIM is, having worked in many different countries. Is it just clash detection or is it where the future's heading, you know, we're down the path of the digital twin? Um, for us, we're well, sort of heading the path of digital twinning and, um, you know, classification of data in the right way with the designers so that, you know, the information they're producing um, can be incorporated into those, those digital twin models. And from a construction point of view, you know, it's not just about the design for me, it's how do we collect the information, how do we keep the information, how do we, how do we work smart on the construction wise in, in that environment as well. Yeah, absolutely, and that helps obviously with the whole life cycle side of things. But I'd be I'd be interested to hear Chris and Bradley's experience in terms of what they're being involved with in Kadir and obviously across the the other projects. For for Chris, is is are you seeing a massive uptick in the utilisation of BIM? Both of you, I mean, I don't know which one wants to start first. I think I could start. Now. So yeah, after okay, Bradley. BIM three hundred and sixty is BIM three hundred and sixty is a key element um, to our design process. You know, we're using subs from around the world and everybody has access to that same library. So, you know, there needs to be a real serious coordination effort to make sure that, you know, the ability to upload the models, the current models, make sure everything, everybody's got the, the current models when there is a, 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 you know, a, a big upload from the schematic side of things, you know, everybody needs to have access to that. Access can be, can be a, a little bit of a challenge you know you bring on a new sub and to get them set up and, and have the, all the rights and privileges to get those models as well it's another small challenge you know two days mm. it's a huge loss if they can't access those models but certainly we are using it on a day-to-day -day basis and it's really beneficial the other thing that we're doing too uh, aren't unique on this project is that we are using the unreal game engine a game engine for a theme park and we're using the actual um, schematic models from the BIM 360 library and importing those into the Unreal Engine. So when we do a visualization of that entire park, we're going to be able to see it in accuracy right to the millimeter of all where the building placements are, all the facade designs, all the trees, all of the landscaping, uh, all of the rides. Everything's going to be in there. And as a visualization tool, it'll be amazing to make minor adjustments just to make it that much better a guest experience. That sounds remarkably complex for somebody who's technologically useless. Um, so, I mean, with, with that, I mean, Chris, I'm sure you're probably seeing something similar. But also, as a secondary question that's been coming through, uh, a lot of the questions we've got here is: Do you think do you think that Saudi Arabia requires a mandating of of BIM modelling, or do you think that the clients are now sort of very much engaged in in the benefits of that, as David and Bradley have outlined, and where uh, um, and the mandating is not required? No. Well, I I think any you know first of all BIM particularly over the last eighteen months has been you know absolutely critical right you know this fact people just can't all sit in the same place um, over a table for as much as I've missed that um, but so I think that you know the smart clients are you know need you know want BIM anyway it's it, to me it's like it's entry stakes you want to play this is it you know I mean because it's yeah. it also falls your FM model. So it, it's like it, you need it all. You need some cost certainty. Play, you know, you need some experiential certainty as Bradley's talking about. You need to, you want to get the thing built properly and you want to be able to maintain it properly. I mean, for us, the, the being able to, the, the range that we work at, the, you know, when you're talking about kilometers of experience, do any other way but digitally. You, you know, in the old days, I would do, you know, we draw perspectives and say, oh, it looks like this, looks like this. But it's not the same as, as driving, you know, 60K down and then you see this and then this appears and this happens. So it's, it's and then that's all tied to, that's not divorced from the actual construction model. So I think the, the, this kind of seamless interface is, you know, has, has been such a, a huge benefit. Um, it's just getting over that first, you know, getting over that pump and getting into it. And I think a lot of the internationals 
are slow to that. And I think that's that's yeah. something that that they're kind of you know depending who they are. Um, but I think it's an absolute necessity. I mean, it's um, with that. I mean, we're talking about mandating and so forth. But I'm I'm kind of thinking now a little bit around that education process um, because. Let's, let's, I've worked on plenty of projects over the years in Saudi Arabia where um, BIM would would have been not even understood what the acronym was was for. Um, but that whole that sort of Saudiization and training and education side of the business. I mean, this is initially really a pretty conversation for David and Simon because you know they're both in country and they're on the ground and we've and. It, Part, obviously, part one of the pillars for, for, for Vision 2030 is to get more started into the uh, private sector and workforce and, and, you know, to train them and develop them. We talk about just BIM, for an example. There is an education process required. I mean, what's, let, let's start with Simon. What's what sort of TNT's uh, take on this, uh, on Saudiization? And second, a secondary point around Saudiization as well is obviously the Saudiization of supply chain. If we looked at ICTVA, in Kingdom Total Value Add that Aramco has, I'm sure there's something similar across all of the giga projects that people are looking at. So Simon, would you like to address those two points first? Yeah, so Saudiization is uh, embedded in, in, in what we do and is, is mandated as part of our commercial registration. So we have targets that we have to meet. But I think the, the challenge we've had and the challenge we're trying to address is uh, certainly from the cost management perspective, um, what we don't see is a pool of trained Saudis that are cost managers. You know, there, there is not a single university or college that provides a cost management uh, course for, for Saudis. So, so what, what, what we're doing at the moment is that we bring in some of the young engineers and we train them into cost managers. Um, what we do find uh, challenging there is the appetite for Saudis to become a cost manager rather than a project manager. So we do the same with project management, um, but our but 90% of our work at the moment is in the cost management field in in Saudi. So it it is a challenge. The, the the guys the guys and girls are just not there in the market with an appetite to do what we do. That's not to say uh, certainly when you when you go and visit the various Giga Project client offices, they are hugely Saudi Saudi eyes, and I think that's incredibly fantastic to see um, but from a consultant perspective i think we find it a lot more challenging uh in terms of attracting them into the private yeah. sector and and what that means in terms of uh, a potential uh compensation package that the private sector is is, is able to to offer them yeah that's you've made a, a very interesting point because I'm going to ask this as a sort of two prong question for David. Firstly, obviously, I'm I'm sure that you've got a very strong Saudiization program, training and development program, but Simon made a very very interesting point around not having a single cost management QS or general practice surveying course or what have it have it to be in Saudi universities, and this sort of thing probably probably needs to be driven a little bit with the support of you as the Giga Project in terms of engaging with the university. So I'm, I'm interested to hear how Amal or, or, or indeed how the others have been engaged to try and sort of say, well, this is the future demand that we need in terms of skill sets. And we need you to sort of recognize that and try and develop something that would be attractive to the younger generations. Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, that, that, um, Saudi resource and that Saudi training. So, so what we did very early on is engage with the um, the Saudi Council of Engineers, and the Saudi Council of Engineers is an authority um, that is responsible for certifying um, all consultants in the market, not just engineers. Um, and so, they have a database of staff. They have a database of um, young engineers and young consultants, Saudi consultants. Um, who are interested in working in the industry. So we've focused a lot on those gaps where we say, you know, cost consultancy is one. Um, the vocational training side is another where we have people in our industry in our respective home countries that don't necessarily need a degree to work in the industry. So how are we going to encourage people without degrees? People within the West Coast area, we're sandwiched between um, at the town of Al Waj and Duba in the Tabuk province. How do we encourage that local employment and that local training? So we've had a lot of um, interaction with the vocational training 
um, authority here as well to look at those courses, the site management, the document control on the cost management side with the Council of Engineers to say, okay, who are the people um, who would be interested in these roles because there is no training um, and therefore how do we get them the training and training that's recognised as well. It's no good printing off a, a certificate and saying you've done this five day course or 10 days course. It's, it's about giving them um, training that is can be linked into either a future degree or future education. And so the Saudi Council of Engineers in particular has been uh, very helpful in that regard. We've got access to their database. We bring a lot of our interns um, into Amala um, through the Council of Engineers, also through the Vocational Training Authority to, to try and fill those gaps that don't exist in the market, that, that exist in the market at the moment. Um, and retraining. I mean, our intern programs also take people from other industries um, who have degrees in business or other areas of economics um, and train them in and, and migrate them across into sort of our, inter our, our industry as well. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's sort of it's good to it's sort of good to hear there. I mean, look, um, the the dealing with the the sort of the supply chain and the Saudi. There's lots of questions that have come in through here about about getting engagement for Saudi supply chain. It sounds to me like uh, David and his team have, have got a pretty good a good work, good leverage into the supply chain through the Council of Engineers and the Saudi Contractors Association. Um, but as a start, there's a subtle change of tack because there's an interesting question for the designers that's come in now. And I quite like it because uh, I'm quite, I've, unfortunately, for better or worse, I've got quite green credentials and I'm quite environmentally concerned. So it's actually, are, we seeing a, are we seeing a sea change towards sustainability? If Christopher Bradley and even even David and Simon can commentate, but the, the, um, the uh, historical trend in KSA was if, if I could say, and I've, I've can give several, if hundreds of examples of this. If I could save a hundred reals and it might it might just emit a bit more pollution, then I'll save a hundred reals and go from there. But it was specifically addressed to Chris, so I'm going to let his answer it first, and then take Bradley's view on the world as well. Well, well, I think the the different gigas had sort of different approaches to same sustainability and let's say a level of a level of intensity. Um, you know, Red Sea and, and Amala right at the sort of right at the top, most sort of stringent basis of the design, uh, the early master planning, others that we've been working with. It's something that's been that's been sort of coming, you know, to become a part of the project. Um, but I think it, just in general, the, there's a there's just a kind of surge of of desire and and you know recognition that you know that these places have to contribute you know socially and ecologically um not just uh, you know not just for a pure enjoyment but there's they have a, a higher purpose um that they all share so i i think it's only going to bring along uh sort of the more typical developers and and projects that are happening in kingdom i mean the gigas have to lead and and people follow yeah. Okay, Bradley, how you how are you seeing sustainability playing into playing into your world? Because as I mentioned, I, I've got hundreds of examples of if we can save a hundred real and it emits double the amount of pollution or what have you. Or uh, in terms of the, I know you're in a specialist area, but is there still a push for Kadir to be a, 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 as sustainable as is possible given its uh, project brief? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a you know my opinion is there's, there's a certain responsibility that every project has for that. You know, whether we're using environmentally friendlier materials than we have in the past, whether we're using, um, you know, reclaimable energy sources, there's there's a lot of different things that go hand in hand. And as a designer, you kind of want to stay on top of it and, and you want to suggest these things. And you're always, at, you know, faced against the challenge of costs versus effectiveness mm -hmm. versus the ability to, to put something together that also um, kind of tells a story to the to the guest or the visitor that's going to come and meet it you know when people see like oh look how look how they're doing that you know it it it, it connects with with the people that that come and visit and I think that's an important aspect of that experience you know when you're being irresponsible 
and doing things the way we did them, you know, 50 years ago, that's going to turn guests off. You know, there, there's a lot, this younger generation is definitely looking for that sustainability factor in all of the experiences that they go to and will avoid experiences if, if it's not addressed. So. Excellent. Okay. Look, I've, I've got one final sort of topic really that's sort of in, in the room that um, I'm interested to look at. We've got, all of these major schemes and whilst PIF is the sort of catalyst and this is either really David or Simon to start this because you both have got experience in the background I've got similar background to you guys um, we've got competing demand in terms of like financing and schemes such as that in just pure finance terms I know there's a lot of liquidity worldwide and investment worldwide etc but do you think that there's a case to be made for like PPP type models, be that design, build, finance, design, build, finance, operate, or, or concession agreements and stuff like that, or, or indeed, are they happening already? I'm going to start that one with Simon and see where he thinks across the Giga projects. Well, I think, I think, I think it's clear that there is potential opportunity there, but um, what, what we've seen in the market at the moment is uh, that it's struggled to gain any real momentum. And uh, when when we drill into why why that might be the case, I think you know what is underpinning some of the nervousness about people committing to invest in that way is um, a reluctance to get guarantees uh, from from the ultimate client. So it's all very well, you know, having very innovative projects that are that are breaking new ground. So if you look at that West Coast, it's you know largely undeveloped. It's, nobody's hardly ever been there. Um, and to get a PPP for an airport, for example, somebody is going to come along and expect to see some sort of guarantee on, on PACs yes. so that they can actually build a business case and a financial model that supports the investment. Um, uh, to, to, to be fair, we're, we're, we're not... We're not heavily involved in the PPP in, in, uh, in, in Saudi, but certainly from what we've seen um, across the projects that we're involved with and on the peripheral of what we're seeing, why things are not going down the PPP route, it seems to be that underpinning level of security mm. of that investment. Why, why would somebody come in and invest huge amounts of money in a, a, yeah. a brand new innovative scheme without any surety that that investment's going to work over a, a given period of time. So I think I think it's there, but I think there is a bit of bit more discussion, a bit more maturity about the the package that is on offer to those sort of investors. Yes, I, I tend to agree. But I mean, I'm going to sort of slightly reframe the question um, for, for David insofar as uh, are you looking at different uh, financing models or is it, is it just reliant on on just cash in bank and, and investors um, and if so if not are you considering looking at those models in in the near in a near or future uh, or further future I mean there's lots of examples of independent water projects in the water power projects in Saudi Arabia no questions asked and they can attract investment as long as it's an underwrite um, are you, is that something that Amal is keen to consider and also, the secondary oh, one is I, I'm guessing that the, um, the export credit agencies are starting to sniff around um, Amala and, and others at this moment in time, which might be, which might be considered attractive as well. Yeah, look, our, our feasibilities for these giga projects uh, aren't based on 100% funding from the public investment fund. I mean, the, the idea behind the giga projects is that the investment fund provides the seed capital to allow the projects to um, be initiated and gain momentum. Um, and then there's a funding strategy around supporting the continued development of these projects. Um, we're in the early stages of um, a PPP RFQ process for our, our what we call our regional infrastructure. So um, our power, our water, um, you know, our ICT and these, these elements that are attractive to investors. And so um, we're going through that pre-qualification process at the moment. Um, the Red Sea, um, you know, our sister project to the south, um, has already onboarded um, PPP for their regional infrastructure. So these, these different types of funding structures are starting to be explored more and more. Um, there are investors and funders who are interested in these models, but again, um, Saudi Arabia is a very new market for this. So all the things you just mentioned about underwriting and providing confidence 
um, for investors without falling into the traps that, you know, PPP, um, uh, you know, has made in other countries, you know, the UK and other places around the world. I mean, it's taken 30 years for sort of PPP in the UK to become something that the government now finds has the right balance with the private sector. Um, and Saudi Arabia is just starting out on that journey. I've got one final question. It's going to go back to Simon. So sorry to the, everyone else. But this is historically, and I use the terminology, Saudi's got a bit of a master-slave co uh, contracting culture. And as, um, as, a, as a QS company, do you think that the, 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 the change of dynamics that's occurring within the kingdom is happening well enough to enable alternative financing models to work? I acknowledge that IWP, IWPP, that type of stuff works because that's essentially a very simple PPP model. But do you think that there's the will and the, and the experience, etc.? I think uh, I, th I think there's certainly the will. I think the pace of that change, I don't think is able to keep up with the pace of the delivery of the project. So I think that's the, the biggest issue. And David alluded to the fact that, you know, this is relatively new. And, and, and if you turn to the UK as, a, as an example, it's a hugely experienced, it's got 30, 40 years of looking at these models. Yeah. In, in other parts of the GCC, we've seen a real reluctance and it's more of a cultural reluctance actually to hand things over to PPP because of, um, because of the, uh, the, the the country wanting to provide for its own own people um, and and that's that that's been a challenge so I I don't at the moment see uh, those financial models um, being able to be put in place as quickly as they are needed for the delivery mm. programs that these projects are currently looking at maybe in subsequent phases we'll see more of it but certainly this this huge drive for this fi phase one delivery i think we will we will see limited amounts of it i mean david alluded to power and water they are the obvious ones that will suit that sort of model and providing you can get the the right contracting um, platform and environment for an investor to come on board and, and deliver that, then I think I think we'll have some success. But in terms of where you could take PPP, I think you'll see that later in later phases. Yeah, I do tend to agree that it has taken quite a long time because I'm sure you probably a similar age to me. When I first started in the industry in the UK, I, I, I probably hadn't, I, all I worked on was something that looked like a PPP or a PFI for the first few years because nothing else was being done. Um, so, uh, I mean, look, with, with that, gentlemen, um, we've now come to the end of our allotted time. I'd like to be, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining this panel. It's been a very interesting and enlightening conversation, and I sincerely hope that we all stay in touch with each other because I've really enjoyed this conversation. So, with that, I'd like you all to say uh, goodbye and and thank the audience for tuning in. Really, thank you very much, David, thank for your moderation. Much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank My you. pleasure, guys. Right, I, I now right, hand bye back bye. over to Gavin's. Uh, and the CPI team. Thank you very much all.